dangerous meeting. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order uh, for the Administration and Finance Committee. Uh, number one, roll call, Marisa. Beatrice Charo. Here. Gabby Canales. Present. Armando Gonzalez. Here. Ana Jimenez. Erica Mamie. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Number two, safety briefing. Mr. Rendon. Good morning, Madam Chair, directors. If there's an emergency, directors will ex ex exit through the kitchen. Everybody else to my right will all report to the clock tower adjacent to the transfer station. Marisa will make sure that directors are accounted for, and I'll make sure that everybody exits the room properly. During the emergency, please do not utilize the elevator. Do not return unless it's all clear. And if we have to shelter in place, we will shelter on the west side as stairwell. Thank you. Thank you. Number three, confirm posting of meetings public notice in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. Marissa, can you confirm the posting of the meetings public notice? Public notice uh, confirmed. Thank you. Receipt of conflict of interest affidavits? None received. None? There are none. Number five, opportunity for public comment, three minute limit, no discussion. There was none submitted online and none in person. Thank you. All righty, agenda item number six, discussion and possible action to approve the Administration and Finance Committee meeting minutes of November 15, 2023 and February 28, 2024. Is there a motion to approve the Administration and Finance Committee meeting minutes for November 15, 23 and February 28, 2024? So moved. Motion by Director Canales. Second. Seconded by Director Gonzalez. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion passes. Agenda item number seven, discussion and possible action to recommend the Board of Directors adopt the revised 2024 emergency preparedness policy. Good morning again. So this is a CCRTA Board of Directors Safety and Security uh, policy that I want to present. A little bit on the background, uh, during and after an emergency situation, CCRTA authority has the responsibility to provide a service to the citizens of the city of Corpus Christi and all our small city um, in the service area, plus the Nueces County unincorporated areas. So the purpose is to, RTA has a responsibility to work in good partnership with the city and the county emergency uh, management office, EMO. And also to provide the emergency preparedness and evacuation service in the communities within the RTA service. Relating to hurricanes and other emergency required evacuation. As you remember, about three years ago, there was a fire at the refinery on 37 in Buddy Lawrence that we were um, notified. We did not uh, evacuate any um, in, in the housing area because the uh, wind was blowing south. But it's some type of situations that is not, not just for uh, hurricanes. But in, in that event, uh, we were notified by the EMO office and we were prepared to evacuate if we had to. So the event sustained, uh, event sustained uh, wind speed are greater than 35 or um, after a landfall of water levels, other conditions become unsafe, our buses will terminate uh, service due to safety reasons. The application, this policy applies to all CCRTA employees including part-time and temporary employees. The emergency event is the refers to a natural and man-made uh, events and hurricanes, tornadoes, ice storm flooding, uh, non-weather related emergencies. The essential position is the employee who is required to be available to work during the emergency. 
uh, essential employees, essential positions who volunteer to work during the emergency, and non-essential employees are, after serving, securing all CCA, RTA property, department heads will release non-essential employees. Employee refuge of last resort, uh, we do have it here at the Staple Street Center and also at the Bear Lane Operation Facility. If anything will change, we will notify our employees. Again, essential are administrators that are directors, managing directors, uh, operators, and mechanics that are in the list. And also, non-essential will be uh, clerks, custodian, and accounting personnel. Initiation uh, phase is our CEO declares the emergency response plan is activated, and that is in June 1st. That's when we start the hurricane season. Department directors notify employees of responsibilities in their emergencies and reporting the expectations. So the three phases that you see there is basically the core of the, of the policy. Um, on to your left, readiness, phase three, is all employees must report to work, uh, regular work schedules. Department heads will make sure the RTA property is secure. Non-essential employees obtain approval to evacuate. Uh, phase two is staff uh, will man the city and the county EOC. The department heads will advise on the location of the employee refuge, last resort. All employees, all essential employees will report to work. And at that time, non-essential employees may be released. Phase one, which is uh, I believe is the most important one here at the end is that uh, as far as conditions are imminent, either the hurricane is in within uh, hours, and EOC staff will inform department heads on emergency events status. The two individuals who are at the city and the county report to the CEO, to the managing directors, and advices of what's going on, uh, how the storm is approaching. And also, you know, provides necessary emergency service that we have to provide. So the return to duty phase is all employees report to work at the start of the next regular uh, scheduled shift. And employees unable to report must call in and speak to a supervisor, manager, director, and notify them where they're at and why are, they're not able to come in. So every year we, we do this, the, the policy really doesn't change. The only thing that changes in the policy is the uh, directors. We have a new CEO from, from last year, uh, I'm the new uh, deputy. Uh, Gordon was promoted to managing director of operation and Leon took his place. So shift does, personnel does change, but the policy remains the same. And we have to update it with that particular information, with new numbers, new positions. Uh, so at this time, staff request board of directors approve the revised 2024 emergency preparedness policy. Thank you. Are there any questions? None? Okay. Is there a motion to recommend the board of directors adopt the revised 2024 emergency preparedness so policy? Motion by Director Jimenez. Second. Seconded by Director Canales. Any further discussion? Okay. Um, any further discussion? No? Okay. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Okay. Motion passes. Um, and then uh, let the record reflect that um, Director Jimenez was present at 8.36 a.m. Agenda item number eight, discussion and possible action to recommend the Board of Directors authorize this Chief Executive Officer or designee to execute and submit the Federal Transit Administration 2024 certifications and assurances. All right, good morning. Uh, Robert Saldani, Managing Director of Administration. So this lines up with the Board Priority of Public Image Transparency. So now going on about three decades here, since 1995, um, the FTA has consolidated 
uh, about 21 different categories into a single document to make sure that we can comply with all federal regulations when we use federal dollars on any kind of project. The shirts and assurances assure that the recipient here complies with the federal requirements. It makes sure that we have institutional knowledge, the managerial and the financial capabilities to execute these projects on a timely basis and complete them. Um, in order to receive federal funds, we must submit these search and assurances on an annual basis, and they just came out about a month ago. We just missed the last board meeting when they came out. So there's 21 different categories. Um, these are the same 21 categories from last year. Sometimes they, they range from 19 to 21 categories, depending on what they, they add in or take out. Uh, the vast majority of them will apply to this agency here. Some don't. Um, if you take a look at them here, lobbying will apply, uh, tax liability, uh, by America, uh, both urbanized and rural grants that we get, state of good repair. The ones that really don't apply to us is kind of like the rail safety, uh, tribal uh, transit program, and then the cybersecurity is one that was implemented last year, and um, that one tends right now to be more over uh, rail. They might expand at some point in time for us with bus and there, but uh, we do have a cybersecurity type program as well. Like I said, not all these provisions will apply with every transit agency, but we need to make sure we um, apply those that, that uh, do affect us. And before we could, uh, FTA can award us any federal funds, whether it's formula funds or competitive funds, we must sign and submit these forms. There is no DBE goal, there's no dollar spent for this. Uh, there's no direct financial impact, although the financial impact is if we don't submit them, we won't get any formula funds or, or or competitive funds in there. So there is a financial effect down the road. At this time, staff requests the board of directors authorize the chief Exec executive officer or designee, as well as our legal counsel, Mr. John Bell, to execute the Federal Transit's fiscal year 2024 certifications and assurances. And I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Is there a motion to recommend the board of directors authorize the CEO or designee to execute and submit the Federal Transit Administration 2024 certifications and assurances? So moved. Motion made by Director Jimenez. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Director Gonzalez. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item number nine, discussion and possible action to recommend the board of directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer or designee to award a professional services agreement to TransPro to perform the 2020-2023 quadrennial performance audit. Okay, this aligns up again with public and transparency. So Chapter 451 requires us on a, every four-year basis to inform the, uh, the state of Texas on several factors about our operation here. Every four years, we have to examine one of the, these three items in here, which is management administration of the authority, transit operations or the transit uh, maintenance system in here. Four years ago, we went over the administration and management of the authority here. This one we're gonna focus in a little bit on the, on the maintenance side. This is in order to comply with chapter 451. And some of the indicators that they look at as well are the cost per operator passenger, cost per revenue mile, the cost per revenue hour, how we use our sales tax in there, our fare recovery rate, our vehicle occupancy, our on-time performance, number of accidents we have per 100,000 miles, and the number of miles between roll calls. And a lot of these items we report on a monthly basis here in our, our reports to the board. Uh, financial pact, so on February 8th of 2024, we sent out a scope of work to several qualified candidates out there and we received two quotes back. Transpro for $70,721.24 and Crow LLP for $179,287.50. Our last quadrennial uh, was issued out late 2020, conducted in early 2021, and it cost a little shy of $23,000. A little background on Transpro, they're based out of Springfield, Spring Hill, uh, Florida. They've had uh, more than a decade experience collaborating with transit agencies. They've conducted over 50 um, of these reviews uh, their staff with previous or um, people with transit professional experience and they partner here with TexDOT on several planning and leadership development programs that they have. 
This time, staff request the administration and finance committee recommend the board of directors authorize the chief officer or designee to award a professional services agreement with TransPro Consulting to perform our state mandated quadrennial review. And I will take any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, is there a motion to recommend the board of directors authorize the CEO or designee to award the professional services agreement to TransPro to perform the 2020 2023 quadrennial performance audit? Motion by Director Jimenez. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Director Canales. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Agenda item number 10, discussion and possible action to recommend the Board of Directors adopt a lower discount rate of 6.75% from 7 7% for the defined benefit plan. All right. Again, once again, this is, lines up with public image and transparency. So back in 2019, staff came to the board and uh, we recommended that we reduce our discount rate from 7.5% down to 7%. Um, most public transit agencies on the high side have a discount rate of 7% and we were trending at 7.5. So back then the board adopted um, the plan to go down a quarter percent or 10 basis points every year from 2019 to 2023. And in 2023 we hit our 7% goal. This helps mandate, uh, match the mandate that we have, the state of um, Texas has on the government code of 802.2011, which requires us to submit a plan to show them how we're gonna get uh, fully funded at some point in time. And this is just all public agencies as well. So when we adopted that to go down 10 basis point each year, we reamended our plan out there to show them that we have this plan to get up there and that we will stay within the range of at least 85 to 95%, which if you take a look at it for public transit agencies and for public funds, that's pretty healthy compared to a lot of people. A lot of people are in the 60, 65, 70 range. So we're really healthy at 85 to 95%. Some of the risks that we take a look at all the time are investments. Um, obviously investments are a volatile uh, item in there, which the volatility can affect the liabilities of your plan. Uh, we look at the discount rate or the rate of return like last year, when you have high interest rates, you usually have a declining stock market, which um, exposes you to increased cost of your plan because your market value is under the value of what it's gonna take to fund that plan. And longevity, so the liabilities will fluctuate depending on longevity. As we get more and more tenure, obviously there's a little more of an impact on the, the, the uh, pension plan. Inflation is always a, a factor to take a look at. Uh, as we have high inflation again, as last year, um, employers scramble to try to keep up with that inflation, which means they usually raise compensation levels up here, which obviously has an impact on our plan, which the salary increase, we tend to look at a three and a half percent on average, and we've been averaging about four to five percent. And then you have legislative risk all the time. So you have a chance for the state of Texas to, to do, put in other um, acts to make, make sure that we had stabilized these plans. Here's some of the costs um, from the plan. So if you take a look at 2019 on the far right hand side, we had investment income at $6.6 .6 million and we paid out to our retirees a little shy of $2 million, $1,927,249. In 2020, we made about $5.5 million and we paid out a little over $2.2 million. And as you go all the way to 2023, we made uh, 5 million, 5.1 million in 2023. We paid out almost $2.6 million, which is about a 6.8% increase from the prior year. And of course, if you look at last year, we lost about 7.4 million due to the market. But as you take a look at it here, our investment income has been fairly healthy except for last year. But as you take a look at it from 2019 to 2023, we went from paying about $1.9 million to almost $2.6 million to benefits. We want to make sure that we keep this fund healthy because as we get more and more tenure in here, we're going to have the higher payouts as people retire. When we meet with our auditors, um, they identified obviously the 7%. They still thought that was a little high. Um, and when you tend to have a higher discount rate, it tends to undervalue your liability side. So um, talking with them, looking at other public transit agencies, um, we took into consideration what they have and, and uh, we're looking at all our surface costs. So we have a couple of recommendations here. One for 2024, our unaudited 2023. So we finished last year. Our plan 
unaudited right now is saying that we're funded at about 90%, which falls in our 85 to 95% range, which is, is good, really healthy. Looking at what we think the market's going to be at this coming year, our rate of returns, um, the, as what we pay to our, our retirees going each year, we're suggesting that we put in another $323,690 and expecting with doing by doing so, we should end up somewhere around 88% if the market acts like it did this last year here. Now, we expect the Fed to lower the rates two, three, high side maybe four times this coming year here, which hopefully will loosen a little bit up and, and stock market will perform a little better with interest rates lowering a little bit, but we'll have to see at that point in time. So far year to date, we've um, contributed $1,994,276 to our plan, and that was through our operating budget, which we knew we were gonna do. But in order to try to get that 88% funded and with the expectations of the market, we like to put in that $323,690 hopefully get that 88% and get that money working for us early in the year. The market has been fairly good the first three months of the year, and we want to take advantage of that right now. So our total contribution this year would be $2,317,966, and this $3,000,000, this $323,690 would come out of unrestricted reserves because, again, $1.9, almost $2 million was in our operating budget. We're also looking to lower the discount rate from seven to six and a quarter, which will better align future expectations, i.e. returns of the plan. Uh, it'll report more accurately our liabilities, potential liabilities of the, of the plan as well, and it'll hopefully meet our future funding levels and our obligations that we have by letting this $300,000 or so act well with the, with the market this coming year. Here's some target ratios at six and a quarter and six and a half. Um, right now, obviously, we're not recommending six and a half. We want to deal with six and a quarter for a while to make sure our plans adjust to that. In order to be 90% funded at the end of the year, uh, we were looking at maybe $2.6 million, 95%, uh, 5.1 million, and 100% funded. Again, with the standard market that we had last year, uh, 7.6, almost $7.7 .7 million to be 100% funded. So. Um, right now, we want to see how the market prevent, uh, performs this year. We don't want to overreact at, at anything to try to get 100% funded and put a lot of money into it right now. The financial impact, we're looking to add the $323,690, um, and that will be taken out of unrestricted reserves. And currently, right now, the unrestricted reserves, nothing restricted according to our operating capital benefits reserve and then our cat catastrophic we'd have about $26,143,000 unrestricted right now. So staff request the Administration and Finance Committee recommend the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer of designee to lower the discount rate by 25 basis points from 7% to 6 and 3 quarter percent to measure our defined benefit plan obligations and increase our 2024 annual contribution by $323,690. And I'll take whatever questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions from the directors? Okay. Um, is there a motion to recommend the board of directors adopt a lower discount rate of 6.75 from 7% for the defined benefit plan? So moved. I'll second. Motion by Director Gonzalez, seconded by Director Jimenez. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank Agenda. you very much. Thank you. Agenda item uh, 11, committee chair report. I don't have anything other to report other than thank you to the staff for providing detailed information for the agenda items. It really helped us understand what um, the agenda items are. Does anybody have any comments they'd like to add? Awesome, thank you. Okay, item number 12, adjourn 857. Okay. All right, with that, I will call the Operations and Capital Projects Committee meeting to order at 8.58 a.m. Um, Marisa, if we could have a roll call, please. Aaron Munoz. Bre uh, here. Lynn Allison. Here. Jeremy Coleman. Here. 
Armando Gonzalez. Here. Eloy Salazar. Here. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, safety briefing, Mr. Rendon. Do we have to do it again? <laughs> so do you have that recording so we can repeat it? Again? Yeah. <laughs> Good morning again, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning. Directors. If we do have an emergency, uh, directors will exit through the kitchen, everybody else to my right. We'll all report to the clock tower adjacent to the transfer station. During the emergency, please do not utilize the elevator. Do not return back to the building unless it's all clear. And if we have to shelter in place of a storm or whatever reason, we'll do it on the west side uh, stairwell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rendon. Um, Marisa, uh, Ms. Mon uh, Montiel, can uh, you please confirm the posting of uh, the meeting's public notice? Public meeting confirmed. Thank you. Please note for the record the meeting has been publicly posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act. We'll move to agenda item number four, receipt of conflict of interest affidavits. Uh, Ms. Montiel, do we have any? There were none received. Right. We'll move on to item number five, opportunity for public comment. Uh, did we receive any public comment? There are no public comments. All right. Then we'll move on to item number six, uh, discussion and possible action to approve the Operations and Capital Projects Committee meeting minutes uh, for January 24th, 2024. Uh, at this time, is there a motion to approve the Operations and Capital Projects Committee meeting minutes of January 24th, 2024? So moved. I have a motion by Director Coleman. Second. And a second by Director uh, Salazar. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right, moving on to item number seven, uh, discussion and possible action to recommend the board of directors authorize the chief executive officer or designee to purchase 15 fixed route compressed natural gas buses from Gillig from the state of Washington Department of Enterprise Services contract. Uh, Gordon, how's it going today? Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. You know, I took a tour of a Q-tip factory yesterday, and I got this as a souvenir. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to pick something, right? So, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take Gordon seriously. Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm doing good. Okay. Yeah, do, doing good <clears throat> on some medication, so doing good. Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> I have witnesses, so. <laughs> Okay, great. So today, uh, let's go ahead and uh, move into uh, the item. Uh, seven. Yes. Um, oh. Do you want to? Did you read item okay. seven? Yeah. Great. Okay. The item uh, before the committee today is to authorize the purchase of 15 fixed route compressed natural gas buses from Gillig from the State of Washington Department of Enterprise Services contract. Uh, the board party for today is public image and transparency. In terms of the background, we currently have a fleet of uh, 61 heavy duty buses. The breakdown is 11 of those are diesel and 50 of those are compressed natural gas. They're primarily used on our fixed route services, especially the high ridership services we have in the system. It's also utilized for special events and emergency services uh, that Mr. Rendon was talking about earlier. Uh, the Federal Transit Administration defines the minimal use of life as 12 years or 500,000 miles on these types of buses. The FAST Act was passed in 2015, and within that, Section 3019 authorized the purchase of vehicles from state cooperative contracts, and that's what we're trying to do here today as well. In terms of bus manufacturers that are out there on the market right now, currently Gillig and New Flyer, they're, they're the only ones that meet the Buy America requirements. So, so we have two to pick from in terms of receiving quotes and, and moving forward with the uh, purchases. And at this time, New Flyer uh, made the decision not to provide a bid for this procurement cycle. And again, that's at this time. And the main reason is they're unable to meet the uh, production schedule that we have. As, as you all know, we need these buses uh, you know, in, in the very near future. In terms of uh, what we're doing now, we're working closely with Gillig to coordinate the production schedules, to get the final quotes, to uh, make sure everything's in order with the co-op, with the uh, state of Washington uh, cooperative uh, purchasing agreement. So we're working on all that right now. And we're before you today to uh, basically ask for financial authority to, uh, to move forward. 
Gillig, uh, we have Gillig buses now for our heavy duty fleet. They've been in business since 1890, a long time. They operate out of a 300,000 square foot facility in Livermore, California, which is the East San Francisco Bay Area. They uh, are the, or they are a leading manufacturer of heavy duty transit buses in the United States. And they have earned their reputation as the lowest cost buses to maintain and operate. In terms of uh, the identified need, before the committee today is a recommendation to purchase 15 Gillig 35 foot CNG buses required to replace an equal number of buses that have met a useful life. Um, that's what we want to do here. And then avoid excessive maintenance costs. Of course, that will um, be one of the benefits. It will also ensure fleet reliability and minimize potential disruptions for our customers, for daily operations, our operators even, and then also uh, emergency response capabilities. The estimated delivery time frame for 15 buses is 12 to 15 months upon the issuance of the purchase order. So that puts us about um, roughly April to about August next year for, for that 12 to 15 month time frame. In terms of financial impact, the um, <clears throat> DBE, uh, there is no DBE associated with this uh, item today. Um, per Gillig, the cost estimate for the 15 Gillig 35 foot CNG buses will remain within a total of 12,750,000 or 850,000 each. The estimated funding breakdown of 12,750,000 for 15 Gillig 35 foot CNG buses is as follows uh, Federal 85% at 10,837,500 or 722,500 each. And then local is at 15%, which is uh, 1,912,500 or 127,500 each. And that totals up to uh, the 12.75 million and the uh, 850,000 each. In terms of uh, financial impact section, moving on in terms of the, the uh, budget sources, within the fiscal year 2023 and 2024 capital improvement program, the buses would be budgeted um, in accordance with the table that's before you. Uh, fiscal year 2023, seven CNG at 5.6, fiscal year 2024, three, CNG, um, which were previously budgeted for electric at 4.5 uh, million roughly, and then five CNG uh, in addition to that at 4.16 million. So that totals 15 buses at 14,328,583. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, low no grant, um, we're seeking additional grant funding uh, for the placement of eight of the 15 buses under the FTA low or no emission vehicle program. And that's pending a, a board resolution we're going to be bringing before the board on April 3rd. So once that's approved, we'll be on our way to, uh, to line that up as well. In terms of the recommendation before the committee staff requests that the operations capital project committee recommend the board of directors authorize a chief executive officer or designee to purchase 15 35 foot fixed route CNG buses from Gilly from the state of Washington Department of Enterprise Services contract. And uh, directors, I would like to, to add, we mentioned the, the low no grant just because it's a question out there. So we're asking for the financial authority to move forward one way or the other, that way we're not delayed, you know, should we not get the low no grant. Plus in our last grant, uh, um, we, you know, we didn't get it. And we had our interview with the FTA. And while we got highly recommended, one of their comments was that it appeared that we had to go through additional steps to even get board approval to purchase the last round of buses. So this, in a sense, will give us financial authority one way or the other. And if we get awarded the grant, should the, the board approve the resolution, then we would just come back for a budget amendment. But we already have the fiscal authority to, to move forward. So they, it's uh, one less thing they can use against us later on to that grant review process. Any, any directors have any questions for uh, Gordon? I have a quick question, Gordon. The bus voted here, this is the 35 foot, correct? Is this the 35 foot? Or our cutaways are 35 foot. Would I, oh. The length of this bus and this photo on this slide, is that the 35 foot? It could either be a 35 or a 40. We, we did uh, obtain that from Gillig's website. Okay. So we're not certain on the size, but, but it either is a 35 or 40 foot. And what are the length of the cutaways? 20, they're 26 feet. Okay, thank you. But they, they're considered medium duty vehicles and can only hold 12 people well, and 13 with the driver, so. And they don't um, make a smaller CNG bus, correct? They do, some, 
some companies do make a, a 30 foot version of the CNG yeah. bus. That was just one of the topics that we get kind of hammered for often and on the radio this morning is just right. the size yeah. of our buses versus it, the, the number of riders. It, it is one thing I would like to clarify though is the, the amount of people you can pack in there in an emergency event or for these special events. So in Beach Debate, it's not uncommon for us to pack 70 people inside of one bus. Sometimes it's, I've seen 75 get packed in there. If you get a small one, you cut down your emergency response capabilities, which I, I, I get. In a, but we've actually pulled some of the 40-footers out of service. So these are all 35s, which is finding a little bit, a little bit better, better blends in there. And we will be looking at some uh, other alternatives for future purchases. We're trying to get caught back up now, thanks to the other bus manufacturer going out of business and having to cancel those orders. Director Salazar. Uh, just, uh, well, first of all, I, I want to congratulate staff for bringing it to us to where a lot of the questions that I would have asked with regards to how many people are, are in the business, uh, very clear that we really don't have much of a choice. I just have one question. What was the difference in the price between the last proposal that we got and this proposal with regards to the purchase? It's very much the same. I mean, the last proposal That's what was I was looking at. It, 847000 so, per unit. This is about 850 we're using right now until we get the final quote from Gilly. But so. the, the quote that we had before that we had approved. It, it was essentially the same price. We're talking a few thousand dollars per bus. Okay. And that, but we're you know there's some delays in finalizing we've added some technology that they need to go back and get costing of but we're anticipating it to come in under this uh, amount i won't say significantly but by a decent uh, amount so we're asking essentially for the max which is very similar to what our last order was in that with the hope that we'll be able to work with them to get it down even lower than that yeah i just uh, you know want to make sure on everything that we do that we do have that transparency and it looks like you staff's done a good job of identifying that we just have one source because people will question it when we only have one proposal and it's been accepted, especially the, the size of this project. Yeah, it, it, purchase. It's an unfortunate situation, and I've told some of my staff, but I, I was actually at a, a different conversation at a CEO's conference, and uh, on the other side of it, Gilly sit there and told Chicago, I'm not bidding on any of your, your, your buses. So basically, the city the size of Chicago is now stuck with the one manufacturer as well. There is another company that will likely, and may have just gained it, but may gain the clearance, but they were a Chinese-owned company called BYD that has transitioned to an American ownership, you know, under the name RIDE, R-Y-D-E, and that, so they were, last I saw, they were working to complete the Buy America paperwork and get that approved, so there could be a third option, you know, soon, just not there yet. That's all the questions I have, thank you. Any other questions from any other directors? Uh, at this time, uh, I will entertain a motion uh, to uh, uh, recommend the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer or designate to purchase 15 fixed route compressed natural gas buses from Gillig. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. A motion by Director Salazar and second by Secretary Allison. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Moving on to agenda item number eight, uh, discussion and possible action to recommend to the Board of Directors uh, authorize the CEO or designee to exercise a two-year option with Bright Star Services for maintenance uniform rental services. Uh, Mr. Robinson. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the board party for today's item is public image and transparency. In terms of background uh, with maintenance uniforms, the current contract uh, was approved by the Board of Directors on March 24, 2021 with Bright Star Services Limited. There were three bids received at the time. Uh, one was deemed non-responsive, and Bright Star was the uh, lowest price and, and most responsible. In terms of the three-year base term, it does have a two-year option. The base term expires on April 27, 2024. The two-year option will service approximately 76 CCRT employees in the following departments, facilities maintenance, vehicle maintenance, parts, information technology or IT, and other management personnel in those departments. Each employee receives 11 sets of shirts and pants, so, and it varies a little bit by department in terms of what they're, uh, what they're wearing. All garments are furnished, laundered, maintained, picked up, and delivered to the Bear Lane Operations Facility weekly, on a weekly basis, so. They're very organized in terms of how they deliver them as well and how they, um, you know, place them so it's easy for the employees to find. Lockers, safety mats, and shop towels are also a part of this service. 
In terms of the identified need, uh, we're here today to exercise the uh, two-year option uh, for 2024 and 2025 to maintain the uniform rental services. An expansion of 16 additional employees have been added to the service contract, which brought us from 60 in, in the base term to 76 now um, with the uh, additional facilities maintenance employees that have been added, also with the additional IT department employees. It's, it's a consistent and professional appearance. As you can see in the picture here, these are some of our mechanics in, in maintenance. And it maintains a firm pricing. For the DBE, there is no disadvantaged business enterprise requirement. The financial impact uh, is uh, as follows. that uh, There's a three-year base term currently, um, right now, that we have for $85,037.56. Um, to date, we've expended about $76,723.87. Uh, of, of that amount. The estimated cost of the two-year option is $81,998 to support 76 employees now, um, and expenditures will be determined by actual usage. In terms of the breakdown by year, uh, you can see here that in 2024 we expect that the budget will be up to about 37500 of course, depending on actual usage and, and whether or not uniforms are damaged or replaced, that, that kind of thing. Also in 2025, uh, 44,498, and that brings us to a total of 81,998 for the two-year option. And it, it, as with the base term, it includes uniforms, damaged uniform replacements, uh, lockers, safety mats, and shop towel services. Um, also, um, is staff transitions from one department to another, that kind of thing. So it counts for all those, all those different uh, aspects. The funds are approved um, for this effort in the 2024 annual operating budget. In terms of the recommendation for the committee, staff requests that the operations projects or capital projects committee recommend the board of directors authorize the chief sector officer or designee to exercise the two-year option on the contract to Bright Star Services Limited for maintenance uniform rental services. And that concludes my presentation. At this time, yeah, uh, Director Allison, if you have a question. Thank you, Gordon. Um, that. It's a relatively low budget item in the big scheme of things, but it's a 20% jump from 23 to 24. Are we adding numbers of uniforms or that's just the increase? I mean, we typically plan for a 10 to 15% increase, but 20 seems a little steep. So I don't know if that includes additional staff and extra uniforms. It, it stems from the increase in the number of, of, yeah. up okay. to 16. So. With that 16 comes different variables that we want to account for, okay. such as if the uniforms are soiled to a point where they need to be replaced or, or if they're damaged. Um, also includes. Oh, I'm sorry. I yeah. see the bullet item here. So, Gordon, so you already compounds. have answered my question in oh, this okay. slide. <laughs> it <laughs> sorry. just compounds when you add additional plays. It compounds yeah. the uh, total. Sorry about that. And I'll add that that was somewhat uh, with myself because uh, after looking at some of the other departments that were working on the, the vehicles and around them, they're still being exposed to the chemicals and things like that. So I wanted to make sure all those employees were taken care of as well and had uh, uniforms they didn't have to take home to get yelled at for throwing in their home washer. And that's so by doing this, we'll have professional dry cleaners and uniforms that are maintained to have the reflective equipment that way. Some of these people are out on the streets working on buses or at our, our stations and I, you know, we want them to be as safe as possible and have the reflective uniforms as well. No, absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions from any other directors? At this time, I'll entertain a motion uh, to authorize the CEO or designee to exercise a two year option with Bright Star Services uh, for maintenance uniform rental services. Is there a motion? Second. Uh, motion by Secretary Allison and second by uh, Director Salazar. Coleman. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. Mm. Coleman. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. All right. And moving on to item number nine, uh, discussion of possible action to recommend the Board of Directors authorize the Chief, uh, the chief Executive Officer designated to enter into negotiations for General Engineering Services Pool. Um, Ms. Montes, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Directors. Hope you're doing well. Uh, this item aligns with the Board Priority for Facilities. Um, and my name is Sharon Montes. I'm the Managing Director of Capital Programs and Customer Services. Okay, just a little background here. The RTA uh, utilizes general engineering services for various tasks. 
inclusive of design for ADA bus stop improvements, bus station designs, parking lot improvements, environmental assessments, project timelines and renderings for grant packages, as well as environmental compliance services. Um, currently, the CCRTA is nearing the end of the last option year for Hanson Professional Services, which was an, the engineer record. Um, however, moving forward, similar to our architectural services pool, we are working to create a general engineering services pool. Identified need. Uh, the purpose is, is listed as follows. It expedites unforeseen work, provides for flexibility uh, relating to a wide selection of engineering services, uh, supports RTA staff with projects that run parallel, uh, and allows for the RTA to work with various engineering firms in the community and throughout the uh, United States. So in order to do that, we had to issue a request for qualifications. Therefore, we issued the qualification on January 30th, and it was due March the 12th. 12 proposals were received, but two were deemed non-responsive. Nine proposals were reviewed and evaluated by a five-member staff team. The 10th proposal was submitted by Ardura and will not be reviewed and, and evaluated until after January 10th of this year, um, given that Mr. Lyon Decker was uh, board chair through January 10th. The firms were evaluated on firm experience, team experience, capacity and capability, management and organizational approach, responsiveness to agency needs, performance standards, quality control program and safety, and DBE, um, and again, we, it was evaluated by a panel of five. So here's a list of the companies and their scores and their locations. Basically, all of them except one has a CCR, uh, CC uh, office, Corpus Christi office. Uh, AECOM, their representative will work out of Houston, but they did make the commitment if they were hired for any particular project they would have an engineer staffed here locally. Um, so AECOM, Hanson Professional, Half Associates, Pape Dawson, Terracon, Munoz, UES, AGCM, and N. Martinez and Associates. Staff is recommending that all the firms be selected to be part of the general engineering services pool. The engineering services pool, they vary in size. There are several large, multidisciplinary ones, a few medium and small, and three that are local firms. Um, CCRTA has received references for majority of the firms, about eight of them, um, and I have worked with the ninth one, so the references were all satisfactory. They did come from Del Mar College, City of Corpus Christi, Via, Metro Valley in Arizona, so, and Cap Metro. All firms are committed to meeting the DBE requirements that will be set for future federal projects. The financial impact, typically the fees will range from 6.5% to 12% of construction. So once the projects are um, designated, uh, at that point we will be able to determine the estimated cost. This is just building the, the pool at this point. Therefore, staff recommends the Operations and Capital Projects Committee recommend the Board of Directors authorize the CEO or designee to enter into negotiations for engineering design services on an as-needed basis with the firm selected for the General Engineering Services Pool. That concludes my presentation, sir. Any directors have any questions for Ms. Montes? Just a comment. Uh, congratulations on expanding the opportunity for small business. Um, the ones, I'm assuming the ones that are smaller in size with the amount of employees got a lower score because of their capabilities in doing the bigger projects versus the smaller projects. So I'm assuming when you have a smaller project, the smaller firms would be considered? Just a yes, question. Yes, sir. There are times when someone will request just a bus stop improvement, whether it's an ADA rider or so forth. So there will be work out there for those types of uh, companies. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? I have a question um, and a comment. 
Chairman, um, and thank you, Ms. Montez. The comment I have is, one, it's great to see so much local um, interest in bidding, you know, becoming a part of our pool. Um, comment, just a reminder to staff, um, and it may pertain to this, just long range mm -hmm. um, surveying and, and, you know, research and development, just to get back to the board in April on the comments we had in public comment about the placement of these stops and the, yes, the facilities and the maintenance and the, 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 the possible needs for security. Well, and I'm not sure if that pertains to this. Well, it, it doesn't pertain to this, but we, we have an update that will be presented at the board, yes, the, okay. the full board. In April, right, yeah. Um, and Thanks. then also, for as far as Ardura, is that a six month um, statute? So it's July, January to July, that makes sense. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, and we made sure to work with our legal counsel too, yeah. just to make sure everything okay. was kosher on there. And they've been informed that, you know, they just yeah. have to wait out the six months. Sure. Makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Then at this point, at this time, uh, I'll entertain a motion to uh, uh, authorize the CEO or designate to enter into negotiations for the general engineering services pool. So moved. Uh, motion by Director Coleman. Is there a second? Second. Uh, second by Director Salazar. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you for your support. And uh, with that, we'll move to item number 10, committee chair report. Uh, I don't have anything, uh, but just want to thank the staff for all your hard work. We really appreciate it. And then obviously, if there's any other directors that have any other comments, uh, please feel free to at this time. Um, I drive by that. Uh, new station and one day I see the building and the next day it's almost completely gone. <laughs> so very fast and you know we saved a bunch of money by making sure that we allowed a small business to participate in the uh, bidding process and uh, saved us what over a hundred thousand dollars and it looks like they're almost done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely and Camacho did it incredibly fast so we're they're, they're just, I mean I, I drove by there like two days later half of it's gone two days later it's almost all <laughs> completely gone so. And the photos in the weekly report have been that's a good, Do yeah. Do you have any update on the feedback from the DOT side and the, the state legislators on what we're looking at for a ribbon cutting? Yeah, n nothing good from the Secretary of Transportation. Their, their schedule is too busy for us from, okay. for, uh, for June. And we, we just Advising received notice it in an election that. year, they couldn't make it happen with uh, somebody from staff, but. Yeah, we, we will have FTA representatives here. So we actually, uh, we've got some more questions with the, the contract we're working on, but um, it's looking like June 14th will, I think, is it 14th or the 15th? Whatever that Friday is, 14th, and that will likely be the, the, the groundbreaking date. Be in so we'll, we'll send it all out once we have that confirmed. We do have some things we're working through with AEP to make sure uh, we're good. <laughs> Great. Uh, anything else? If not, we'll go ahead and adjourn this meeting at 926 a.m. <laughs>